it leaves this whole pool of businesses out there that are looking to acquire credit and they're stuck. Saf, so good to have you here. Welcome to the show. Thanks, Brian. Thanks for having me on. I am so glad to be talking to you. Um, first of all, for those who don't know you, um, tell us a bit about yourself and what you do. Yeah, uh, sure. So uh, basically on my end, what I do is I, I expertise in helping businesses acquire financing for small to medium-sized businesses. I've been working in strategy and development for the last seven years, specifically with the finance industry for the last four years. And basically my target uh, acquisition is through a company which I represent as well, Thinking Capital. And yeah, that's it. I do, uh, I do analysis and I basically advise customers on the best financial solution and guide them through the process and also help them with other things related to their business, whether it be making financial decisions within their organization or acquiring financing elsewhere as well. Right, that's perfect. And you, you mentioned small and medium business um, sized businesses, and the listeners are all very often st small business owners and entrepreneurs. So, what have your experience been like, and what are some of the stories? Maybe you can talk about, um, maybe not specifically, but some of the stories that of the people that yeah, you've helped. Sure. Absolutely. So. When it comes to small and medium-sized businesses, uh, banks, I mean, they're great. They, they definitely can't support the businesses, but they're better on a macroeconomic scale. So they're really good at going over macroeconomics. When it comes to the micro businesses that we have out there, um, it's a different kind of pattern that we have to really see because there's a lot of businesses which are new as well. So they have trouble acquiring financing right off the bat. Because there's minimum requirements that the banks are going to ask for, like that they be at least two years in business. They've got to have a projected cash flow for profit loss statements. They've got to be generating a certain amount of revenue. Being all the check marks being checked, it makes it not only a lot of documentation, but hard for customers to go out and get funding. Um, it makes it something where they can't wait in a, in a very fast paced market that we're in for SMBs. People need to acquire funding within a very short frame of timing. They're not looking at wait two months uh, because they're waiting for that kind of investment for their inventory or whether it be to renovate their business or mm -hmm. to market their business. So they're looking for funding in a very short aspect, not in terms of the amount that they're looking for, but in the, in the term and also in how fast they need the money. So, um, the beauty about it is that accessing credit is getting difficult more and more now that we're in a pandemic as well. Uh, mm -hmm. But there are reliable sources of getting credit, such as thinking capital that can help and help those people that are looking for financing. Yeah, like I can tell you a bit about my personal story. Um, I incorporated in May. Um, and it was impossible for me to get even a, a $5,000 loan. I, and what I had to do was um, they were like, oh, come back next year. And I was like, okay, but I need, I need a new laptop now. <laughs> like I can't run my business with a broken laptop. I do digital advertising. Um, I, I used, I, I worked a, where's my, I had, where's my phone? I had a broken phone and I had to work off of a broken screen on my, on my, on my cell phone for, for a good week because I, I was waiting for the bank to get back to me. Um, and just to, for them to say no. And then what ended up happening is I had to put it on my personal credit card and I'm still paying that off now. Um, but like I, I'm making a, you know, a decent amount of money every month and, and the bank is still like, nope, you don't check the, the uh, requirements uh, because you incorporated it too, uh, too recently. That's, that's, a big, that's a big thing with, with 
customers uh, these days is that the bank always puts a minimum threshold, right? Like of how long you need to be incorporated with because there's certain documentation, whether it be taxes, mm -hmm. uh, their previous financials, their growth percentage. So the problem is a lot of data, but the problem is that these businesses need money now. Exactly. If they want to grow and they want to scale like yourself, right? Like you need, you needed the, you needed the money. Like he's telling you to come back next year. You're not going to work with a broken piece of equipment for one year. You know, like mm. it just doesn't make sense. So what it does is that it leaves this whole pool of businesses out there that are looking to acquire credit and they're stuck. They just can't, they don't have a place to go. It's not even like, Hey, if you do this, 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 we can acquire the funding for you. It's more like, unfortunately we can, we can't service you. So it, it, it puts a lot of hardworking business owners in a tough position to acquire funding. And that's exactly it. Like I, I met all the other check marks and it's just, I, I incorporated last month instead of, you know, two years ago, for example, I yeah. was operating as a sole proprietor for, for almost five years. Okay. Yeah. And, and then I switched over to, um, to an corporation. And they're like, no, yeah. we, because they're two different identities. And I was like, okay, then I guess I need to buy this laptop in a different manner. Yeah, it's, it, it's honestly, it's a common thing where the bank, when you'll go from being a sole proprietor to a legal incorporation or an incorporation, because the identity of the incorporation protects the business itself and is the valuation of the business versus the sole proprietor where you can be operating under many other umbrellas. So you could mm -hmm. be operating under three different businesses that make up your income, especially when you're declaring your, your income and your taxes. So for the bank, for them to be specifically evaluating that particular business, they want to make sure that the incorporation time is separate from the time of being a sole proprietor. Whereas in private lending, uh, like for example, where, where I work at Thinking Capital, they, they would include the time as a sole proprietor and move into a transition. But the problem with the market today is that uh, they don't take into consideration those things. So it's like, if you've been a sole proprietor for 10 years, let's say, you know, a regular mom and pop shop that have been there for 10 years, hardworking people, they get to the 11th year, they decide that they want to incorporate. Well, for the bank, you're only in time in, time in business from the day that you've incorporated. Exactly. And, and speaking of yeah. um, current climate, like how has things changed since, um, since the pandemic hit, like, um, how are your clients doing? How, how, how are you seeing the economic yeah. um, uh, scenario around you? As, so I think that we took massive, massive blow um, in terms of reworking the model, in terms of mm -hmm. all the, the business that we saw. But one thing that I can say about the clients that I've seen as SMBs is the resilience. There's a lot of businesses that, you know, they are going still through a difficult period. The pandemic is not over. It is still going on. You know, businesses are still closed on government mandated restrictions. But uh, what I saw is a lot of businesses that have resilience. A lot of people thought that more businesses would close down. Much more of them would, you know, get defaulted or et cetera. And what we saw was a vast majority of people that found creative ways to generate revenue in their business to stay afloat. And they still have been staying afloat. Um, you know, there have been some government help as well that was, was able to help them, like the government loan, which was still available, the $40,000 loan, and different mm -hmm. tools for wage subsidy and, and rent subsidy. So combined with the tools and the resilience of SMB owners with, uh, you know, their new ways of make, generating income, I've seen business owners that have gone from manufacturing regular uh, kitchen equipment to man man manufacturing PPE equipment and mm -hmm. getting contracts with Health Canada. So these are things that people are doing to kind of change their, change their business, adapt with the economy and the ec economic climate we have today so that they can kind of push forward, which is not an easy task, to be honest. It's a really difficult task. Yeah, for sure. And I, I think this is... Uh... So kind of like a feel good story that I'm hearing through my sort of like network as well is uh, a lot of people are adapting, like you said, and um, th they're still hurting, but yeah, they're, they're making do. And I think that's the, that speaks to the ingenuity of small business owners and um, 
and how they find opportunity, even though things seem bleak. Uh, myself, as an example, as well, like and some of my friends, like we transition from full time job, full time work to now focusing on building value, building our own company, growing it. I have people. Um, I have colleagues that work in um, fashion, for example. Uh, they're manufacturing almost nonstop daily uh, PPE. And that's sort of um, their pivot to kind of stay afloat in this business. Right. And it's amazing that they, they, they made that transition because it's not an easy transition period either. Yeah. And you mentioned, um, you know, some companies making pivots, they're, they're resilient, but at the end of the day, like bills have to be paid. Um, like I see all my bills coming in at the end of the month, at the beginning of the month. Uh, so what yeah. are some ways that uh, small business owners can access funding or, you know, um, you talked about some of the loans that from the government, um, can you walk us through some of the, um, the funding that small business owners can have access to? For sure. Sure. So, I mean, right now, the, I mean, the, the first and foremost thing that every business that qualifies uh, should have already done is applied for the Canadian Emergency Business Loan, uh, which is available through the government federal website. This allows them to access, a, in most cases, each financial institutions are giving favorable terms. So typically what I've seen is that they're getting a five-year $40,000 loan. If they repay it back within 24 months, the government will forgive $10,000 out of the 40,000. So they're only repaying back 30. And most cases, the first two years have no interest, followed by three years, which have a small amount of interest. Another thing, another massive pivot, which the government has done, which has helped a lot of places with commercial locations is the rent subsidy. Because previously the way that the rent subsidy worked is that anybody that was trying to get the rent subsidy it would have to be the owner of the building. So the landlord would have to apply with the government for that rent subsidy. So a lot of those landlords had the option to say yay or nay. If they didn't want to do it, the tenant has to pay the full rent. Now, what the government has done is they've changed that rule. They realized that a lot of people were not getting access to any kind of rent subsidy because of the fact that they were, you know, not access the good landlord didn't want to do anything for it so what we have now is the opportunity for business owners themselves to apply for the rent subsidy so that the government can cover several months of the rent or a percentage of it and the same thing goes for wages every business that has a storefront has employees that has revenue being generated or revenue being lost should be applying for these tools they're being offered to every Canadian business owner if they meet the minimum requirements, which are not a lot, uh, they just have to make sure that their taxes are filed and that they're up to date. But apart from that, they have access to that. Now, there's a lot of other businesses on another spectrum that are trying to access credit. Accessing credit because the money that's being lent from the banks are actually coming from the government. So anything additional uh, for the business is difficult. And it's very difficult right now because of where, where we are. But at least there is private entities like Thinking Capital, for example, where we are lending money to businesses and we're doing it faster than ever. So we're doing it within 24 hours. And it just takes businesses that are at least six months in business uh, that are there. And if, if, they, if they're at least six months, we can open the conversation and try to help them access a business line of credit. Awesome. And actually, that's, that's my next question is I've actually... Okay just applied for a business credit card and it was jump like it was they made me jump through hoops you know stand on my head for a bit um dance uh dance on one toe it was yeah. difficult and um but part of that is because my business is so new i had to personally guarantee it and so now the credit card that's meant for the business is backed by backed by me personally which kind of um, negates the purpose of having a corporation to have an insulated buffer there in terms of liability. Um, so what's one way that small business owners can, uh, can build business credit? Like what have you seen your clients do? Right. So, I mean, it's a, it's a great question, by the way. And 
there's a lot of people, uh, you know, you, I'm, I'm glad you actually know, because you've seen the terms probably of your business credit card. But in fact, every single business credit card has a personal guarantee now because of the credit industry and how it's been affected. Um, so that's one thing is that they are putting personal guarantees on every, I mean, which is better than your regular type of uh, collateralization, because technically speaking, it gives, it buys you time. If ever you become, you're in financial trouble, you can find a way to come to a common agreement before they start the entire collection process versus when you have a collateralized business loan or a collateralized uh, credit, credit access, they're going to collateralize the business assets within the business. And they have access to that right away if you're not paying. So it kind of gives you uh, a break. It doesn't mean you're not liable. You are a hundred percent liable for it, but it definitely gives you that, that break. Uh, now, just going on to the uh, ways to build credit uh, is specific to industry, I would say. So a lot of businesses that require equipment, you know, like whether it be a restaurant, whether it be a bar, whether it be rails for your boutique, whether it be a construction company, um, when you're leasing equipment or you're financing equipment, it builds good business credit. So what happens actually is that any time that you purchase or lease finance, specifically finance or lease equipment, it's being built on your commercial credit. Because one thing that happens, the mistake that new business owners make is that they don't make the, they don't make the separation in between commercial credit and personal credit. On commercial credit, it's completely separate than your personal credit. Of course, if you have a bankruptcy or you have a consumer proposal, it's going to be very difficult to access credit on both ends of the spectrum. But to build a business credit, I would say the first thing to any small business owner out there that's listening is try to finance or lease equipment under the business name. First step. Second step is, like you said, getting a business credit card. These are really important tools for you to build your credit at the very beginning, whether it be getting a company car. Uh, company equipment, a business credit card. These are the fundamental tools to building credit in a business. Because if you're not building that initial credit, even if you're several years in business and you're generating an amazing amount of revenue, the bank will still shut you down because they need repayment history. That's how they, they're able to you know, build it up. So it's almost like a, um, a high school student um, just coming out of uh, high school and getting their first credit card or student credit card. Um, exactly. I, had, I had one when I was, uh, when I turned 18 and I've had the same card ever since. Um, so it's well, the same my, scenario, right? Yeah, exactly. I mean, it's funny that you, you said that because that's the exact example that I use with my customers is that mm -hmm. oftentimes people will tell me that they have an amazing credit score on the personal and I explain to them that the business credit is a, is like a student coming out and applying for the first credit card. You can't start by asking for a, a you know, $50,000 loan if you've never had a credit card in your life. Right. Same thing goes for any kind of personal credit card. You wouldn't go to the bank and expect to get a $50,000 credit card if you haven't had a $1,000 balance credit card. You have to be realistic about the situation. Mm -hmm. That being said, by going through that avenue of building up your credit, the bank's going to say, hey, well, you know what? He took this amount of money with this credit card, uh, paid it back several months, so we can increase the limit here. Now there's, now, now you're applying for a business loan down the line two years later. And okay, so we have previous history. Commercial credit is great. Because the way that commercial credit is graded is very different from how personal credit is graded. When you actually okay. look at a personal credit report and a, a business credit report, the score of how it's made up has 500 more inputs on the business credit than it does on the personal credit. They're looking mm -hmm. at much more data, much more impact. So it's going into a lot of aspects of the business that are making the business credit versus the personal mm -hmm. credit, which is okay. pure credit debt ratio, amount of trade lines, credit accessibility, there's just the fundamental list that are breaking down there and where commercial is much more complicated. So it's looking at how much debt you've incurred onto yourself, onto your business. And it, it kind of like just makes a whole mix to make that commercial credit. Okay. That makes sense. So what would you like, you deal with a lot of clients and you deal with a lot of um, people asking you questions all the time. So what's one uh, question that you get almost 
all the time? And what would you say um, uh, is the best answer to that question? Yeah, so I, I would say basically the most common answer uh, for any business that we deal, uh, we deal with is how to acquire the largest amount of, uh, of credit. So every business owner's dream is how do I increase my business credit that I can get from my business so that I can keep growing and also get larger amounts of, of credit. This is, this is a main, a main, main concern for a lot of businesses because a lot of businesses come in um, asking for very large amounts, which it's not to blame. I mean, they know what they need and they know that it, with that capital, they're going to generate a lot of income future coming up into the futures of the business. So I would say that the first thing is, you know, just making realizations and also building expectations with my, my clients is that for you to access large amounts of credit, you need a small with small amounts of credit. It's a fundamental basis that every business owner needs to understand is that everybody wants access to large amounts of credit to be able to accomplish their goals in their business. Everybody has a timeline of what they want. If you build business credit, you will build a higher amount of equity, sorry, of credit that you're going to have access to. You're also going to be able to access better products, better terms. These come with repayment history. This comes with keeping your credit intact. And this comes with also keeping a good growth period in your business. A common problem that a lot of businesses do is volatility. So they'll, they'll have seven great months out of the year, and then they'll have five months where they'll have a complete decline in sales. This is something that any institution doesn't want to see. They want to make sure that the business is consistent so that any time of the year, they're able to make the payments for the loan that they're given, if they're, especially if they're given a large amount. So you really, they really have to build, it's, it's up to the business owner to build a consistency and a flow of consistent revenue coming into the business so that they're able to present themselves in front of any institution and they will providing them with the fact that, hey, you know what, this customer is generating a consistent flow of revenue. Let's help that. Uh, let, let, that's a good point. And that's something that, you know, it's a common, it's a common mistake with customers just coming in is, uh, and it's a common question as well as, you know, how do I access a lot of credit? You got to keep, you got to start with a smaller loan, smaller credit and build it up would, would be the greatest answers. And it, patience is a, is a virtue like anything, but that is definitely the way to, <laughs> to get to that level. You know, that's, that's the most common, common sense element to it. No, that makes sense. That makes sense. And I think um, for me, I, uh, I wasn't asking for a lot, but then I, I kind of knew this intuitively. So when I, I first applied for a loan, I, I, I just needed, I just needed 15 K. Um, uh, but it sounds to me from what you, what you explained, that um, my business is the perfect candidate to build that uh, uh, sta yeah, stable it, revenue. It really is. All right. Stable revenue. And I have uh, clients that pay regularly set amounts and there's no lull in terms of like, uh, volatility. So I'm super excited to get to a point where I, I can access larger amounts of credit to scale yep. my company. Cause I know for every X thousand of dollars that's coming in, I can do 1.3 for sure, because I know how to use that money to generate more, uh, more clients. Cause lead generation is my ex expertise, right? Right. I can, if I can generate leads for my clients, I can generate leads for myself. I just need that first, Absolutely. first bucket of money to, um, to invest into lead generation so that I can have more, um, revenue coming in. Uh, so you've answered a very, very important question for me. Yeah. And you answered one as well, which is that every, I think what you just said there, there's something that was really, really well said there is that. What you can take from, from the beginning factor is that your first loan will always be your hardest loan, no matter how you look at it. So something that's comforting that any business owner can take with them today is that your first loan is always going to be your most difficult loan to acquire as a business because of how new your business credit is, 
of how high the risk is in, in funding that business. But moving on from them, showing that, that that business has a value of repaying, has the correct business ethics of you know, providing the right documentation, it builds a standard for their own business for, uh, for accessing credit through different institutions. For sure. Um, and I, I've learned so much from you. I'm actually going to uh, start putting more things on uh, lease and financing plans uh, through the business. I got my first, uh, first cell phone. So that cell phone I was talking about that was broken, I've finally replaced it with a new cell phone yeah. on, a, on a lease uh, through the business. So that's the first small step. The next small step is to, uh, to leasing more equipment for, uh, for the business to continue to grow and to make it more efficient. So yeah, that's, that's my that's biggest takeaway way. today. <laughs> <laughs> that's great. I'm so glad uh, that you explained that to me. Um, so I, I'm going to start asking all my guests to kind of uh, one question to end off, um, end off the show. Perfect. Uh, so you've been in the business for a very long time and you've, uh, you know, you're an expert in your field. Uh, the question is, what would you tell yourself um, when you first started knowing what you know now? So what's that one piece of advice that you would tell yourself way back when, pe- when you're st- uh, you were starting out? The first piece of advice that I would give myself when I would, if I could go back and rewind the clock three and a half years later is limit the expectations of a customer. Never over promise because you always want to make your customers happy, but you should never do it at expense of providing, uh, you know, cause you try to help everybody out. You have good intentions. And when you're learning in a, in a, in a diverse FinTech company and a financial technology company, and you're learning through sets of rules and sets of hoops and there's so much information inputting it every month and it's rapid in terms of the financial model it keeps changing back and forth back and forth because of how we're so diversified and we're, we're always integrating and adapting with the market you need to be sure that the information you're providing is not only clear which is something i always did but also setting the expectations you never want to tell somebody because this is their livelihood when you're promising someone to access them credit you have to know that there is a baseline for this, that this is affecting them on a personal, not only in a business level, a personal level on their personal objective. So you want to try to limit the expectation of every business owner and they'll respect you for it because by limiting the expectation that it will show integrity on your part and it will also show transparency with the customer so that in the future, if you know you come back to them, you're never giving them something worse than what you said. And if you're giving them something better, then everyone can say kumbaya and go home. It'll be good. It'll be great. But at least you'll, you'll have done your job and kept your integrity and kept your expectations correct for your customers so that they know what they should be uh, waiting for at the end of the tunnel. Awesome. That's, that's great advice um, and something that I take to heart as well. So thank you for that. Before signing off, wh- where can people find you? How can, we get in, um, how can people get in touch with you? Um, to talk about their financial needs. Absolutely. So uh, I currently work as a, as a senior advisor, account executive at Thinking Capital. Um, so if they simply just look up Thinking Capital, uh, they'll, they can call in on the main line and ask for me specifically. So it's Zafir Thirani. And if not, if, they, if ever they want to reach me on the Ontario base, uh, you, you can just shoot me an email at zthirani at thinkingcapital.ca. Awesome. Thank you so much uh, for answering our questions and guiding us through some of the, uh, uh, the ins and outs of small business financing and funding. Uh, I'd love to have you on the show again. So maybe we can chat about this after um, to get you on a second episode. For sure. For sure. Thanks for having me on, Brian. I really appreciate it. All right. Thank you and take care. You too. Have a good night. Hi, Brian here. I really enjoyed my conversation with Safir today, and I learned a lot. So much so that I'm going to invite him on for another episode to talk about how to generate a return on your investment when you take financing or funding from a third party. So be sure to like, comment, and subscribe, 
hit the notification bell so that you'll be notified when Saphir's next episode comes out. Stay tuned.